is your patient, their anxiety or excitement, which could induce a situational hypertension. And in some cases that can be pretty marked. Um, you wanna be sure you're measuring in a quiet area away from other animals prior to other procedures that you're gonna be doing with that animal. And you wanna to try to acclimate them to their surroundings for about five to 10 minutes, if possible, owner present um, with pretty minimal restraint. It's really important to choose a correct cuff size as well. Um, the width of your cuff should be about 30 to 40% of the circumference of the extremity you're going to be using. You should take your first measurement and usually discard it and then take an average of about five to seven consecutive measurements. Um, you wanna discard and repeat the measurements if there's any substantial variation with them. If it's trending down, you know, cause sometimes the animal is going to be relaxing, then you can continue until the numbers kind of plateau and then get your average of several measurements. Um, if there's a progressive increase, try to interpret it in a clinical context of that individual patient. You know, are they stressed? Are they painful? Things like that. You wanna, in your records, keep a note of the animal position, their attitude, are they stressed? Are they calm? Things like that. The cuff size and the site that was used um, so that when you're taking it again, you're making sure to use that same cuff size and site. And if it's a loud area, you can also, especially with awesome, uh, excuse me, Doppler, use headphones to hear the, the sounds better. So this is gonna be the most common Doppler unit. It's the Park Doppler device. Um, I included roughly what they cost. So you can get it for about $710 for just the device um, to buy the cuffs, which you're gonna want at probably at least like five or six different sizes of cuffs. They're about $10 each. And then the sphygmomanometer is about $126. I would recommend getting a case for them because you want to be able to keep that crystal in the unit safe. And if you buy it with the device itself, it's a little bit less than if you come back and buy it later on. So just some things that you'll need when getting a Doppler blood pressure. You're going to need some clippers, alcohol for clipping and wetting hair. Um, I like to clip them every single time I do it. Um, because you're going to get the best contact by doing that. You're going to need your Doppler unit and your sphygmomanometer, some ultrasound coupling gel, an inflatable cuff, um, the rubber tubing that connects the cuff and the sphygmomanometer, and in some cases you're going to want some headphones or earphones um, if it's difficult to hear the Doppler signal. And in this picture here is one of my patients just illustrating um, you want them to be comfortable and restraint should be pretty minimal if possible. So step by step for obtaining a Doppler blood pressure, you want to decide on a location. Um, most of the studies say a forelimb is going to give you the most accurate results, but your choices include, you know, dorsal pedals and front or back digitals and then coccygeal, so on the tail. Um, you wanna place the pressure cuff to, attach the pressure cuff to a sphygmomanometer and place it proximal to the chosen artery. You wanna clip the hair or, and or wet the coat with alcohol over that chosen area and apply ultrasound coupling gel to the Doppler probe. Then place the Doppler probe over the artery parallel to blood flow. You're gonna then inflate the cuff until the artery is occluded and Doppler sounds are no longer heard and then slowly deflate the cuff while observing the number on the sphygmometer and you'll record the pressure at which the first audible arterial pulse is heard. And again, average three to five, five to seven measurements depending on how accurate or similar those numbers are. So some things that might affect obtaining accurate results, cuff size is a big one. Um, a cuff that is too large is going to falsely decrease the reading. On that same note, a cuff that is much too small will falsely elevate the reading. Restraint isn't always necessary. You're gonna increase your blood pressure if you're patient, on the patient if um, they're stressed out, so do your best to avoid stress. And then, 
position. Ideally, patients are lying in lateral recumbency with the cuff position in the limb at the level of the right atrium. Um, this is another type of blood pressure measuring device called the PET map. Um, it, it's more of an oscillometric type, but it has very good correlation to systolic, diastolic, and means is what they'll give you versus the Doppler just gives you a systolic blood pressure. It is a little bit more expensive. Um, the, the pet map graphic two is probably all you'd really need and it costs about almost $1,500, but it does come with everything that you would need. Um, the nice thing about it is it doesn't require a lot of user experience. It's kind of very much plug and play and go um, and it gets you pretty accurate results. So if we talk about the definition of hypertension, it's literally just a sustained increase in systolic blood pressure. And we talk about different types of hypertension. So there's your environmental or situational hypertension. Um, with, there's a hypertension that's associated with other diseases, which is referred to as secondary. And then there's hypertension in the absence of other diseases, which is idiopathic hypertension. So for situational hypertension, this is going to be as a consequence of in-clinic measurement process in an otherwise normotensive patient. It's caused by the autonomic nervous system and arises from anxiety, excitement, um, and effects on higher sensors of the central nervous system. It resolves with decreasing that physiologic stimulus and right now, based off of all the studies, there's no justification to treat it. Um, so we don't recommend treating if you think it's a situational hypertension. So secondary hypertension is a persistent pathologically increased blood pressure that is concurrent with a disease or condition known to cause hypertension or hypertension that's associated with administration of a therapeutic agent or ingestion of a toxic substance known to cause increased blood pressure. This type of hypertension can potentially persist with even once you treat the primary cause for the hypertension. So I'm just gonna scroll through here because this was originally made to be an interactive lecture. So some diseases in dogs that can cause secondary hypertension, chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury are gonna be some of the biggest ones. Um, Cushing's disease, whether they're on steroids and it's a secondary Cushing or iatrogenic or they have naturally occurring Cushing's can cause it. Diabetes, obesity, um, primary hyperaldosteronism, not as common in dogs, but has been reported Theochromocytoma is definitely something that can be seen in dogs. Hypothyroidism, it can cause hypertension, but it's not a very common cause of it. And then brachycephalic syndrome as well. And so in cats, our biggest one is gonna be chronic kidney disease, again. Um, diabetes is also on there. Hyperthyroidism is another one. Uh, more common in cats, primary hyperaldosteronism, not the most common endocrine disease causing hypertension, but we do see it. Pheochromocytoma is less common in cats, but they do happen. And then your very rare cushionoid cat can also have hypertension. And then drugs that can secondarily cause hypertension, it, it's a pretty long list. So steroids, um, at least in dogs, there's a statistically significant mild to moderate dose dependent increase in blood pressure noted at doses that are gonna induce signs of iatrogenic Cushing's. Um, systemic hypertension is uncommon in dogs given agents with pure glucocorticoid activity. Um, so that would be something like methylprednisolone or dexamethasone, but your prednisone, prednisolone is probably gonna be more likely to cause the hypertension. So also in dogs, mineral corticoids, so your DOCP, um, you know, percortin, zycortal, 
is going to at dosages in at high dosages in normal dogs can cause some statistically significant increase in blood pressure. Um, DOCP at a clinically relevant dosage usually is not associated with it though, so only in dogs on high doses. So the next one is erythropoiesis stimulating agents. That one isn't totally clear whether it's the drug or a consequence of the CKD, but it's definitely been noted and something to keep in mind. Um, proin, phenylpropanolamine, PPA can cause a transient hypertension. Um, phenylephrine, even those just used topically for cataract surgery have been associated with it. Ephedrine and pseudoephedrine intoxication is another one. Palladia is another big one. Um, many oncologists will have blood pressures taken before a patient is started on palladia so that if there are any concerns later on down the road, that's something they can compare. And then whether increased salt in the diet um, in general could cause it is not totally clear. So far, they think may be less likely to be an issue. So some toxins that have been reported in the literature, cocaine in dogs um, has actually been reported in, as an intoxicant that can cause hypertension. Um, Adderall, so methamphetamine, amphetamines in dogs can do it. Um, hydroxytryptophan, so that is usually a um, supplement that people might take and it could also cause it. And then some ones that they're not sure of but can cause hypertension in people include guarana because it often has caffeine in it, um, mahuang, which often contains ephedrine, tacrolimus, we don't know, licorice and bitter orange, not totally clear, but it can cause it in people. So idiopathic hypertension, it used to be called primary or essential in people to describe a persistent pathologic hypertension in the absence of an identifiable cause. Essential hypertension has also been reported in dogs. Um, subclinical kidney disease is often thought to be the cause for this in people and animals with hypertension without a clear cause. Uh, the presence of a chronically elevated blood pressure usually means one or more neurohormonal and renal systems responsible for regulating blood pressure is abnormal. And so that's why they've kind of moved to the term of idiopathic in place of essential. And just if we were to break down exactly what idiopathic means, it's an increase in blood pressure again in the absence of an overt clinical cause. It's suspected when reliable blood pressure measurements show sustained increase in blood pressure with a normal CBC chemistry and urinalysis. Um, something to keep in mind is that an increased blood pressure can induce polyuria because of a pressure diuresis. So the presence of a low USG in a patient with an increased blood pressure doesn't necessarily mean they have kidney disease because that can trick you. Um, the presence of a concentrated urine, on the other hand, means that kidney disease is less likely. All patients that you're screening for hypertension should have a CBC chemistry urinalysis. And then some of the next steps to consider can include an ultrasound to evaluate their kidneys, evaluate for tumors, um, looking at SDMA, uh, some people say measurement of GFR, but that's not always available just on a, a normal clinical level. It's a little bit more academic. Checking for proteinuria, measuring thyroid hormone, particularly in cats, to rule out hyperthyroidism, looking at cortisol levels or other testing for Cushing's disease, particularly in dogs. And in certain individuals, you may need serum or urine aldosterone and catecholamine and adrenal ultrasound if you're concerned for some sort of adrenal tumor causing the hypertension. So next I'm going to talk about target organ damage. So a chronically increased blood pressure is going to cause injury to certain tissues. So treatment is, the goal of treatment is to prevent that injury. Um, target organ damage is defined as damage from a sustained increase in blood pressure and the presence in, is a strong indication for antihypertensive treatment. Um, 
proteinuria has been associated with hypertension. Actually, I think, there we go. So in dogs, um, kidney disease, as well as cats is a big one, but for hypertension, it's usually associated with the magnitude of proteinuria in dogs. Um, hypertension is usually associated with shorter renal survival if proteinuria is excluded from analysis from a lot of studies. Uh, proteinuria is directly related to the extent of the increase in blood pressure and the rate of decrease in GFR. Um, dogs with leishmania often have proteinuria and systemic hypertension, which might be from an immune-mediated glomerular nephritis. Hypertension can be present in greyhounds, and there's an increased prevalence of microalbuminuria with no histological evidence of renal injury, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and the creatinine concentration in these patients that are hypertensive, and particularly the ones that are hypertensive and proteinuric, um, is not going to be directly related to your blood pressure. So next is the eyes. Um, cats are a big one. They have a high frequency for ocular injury in some studies, as high as 100%. It can be seen in dogs too. Um, it's called a hypertensive retinopathy and choroidopathy. Usually on your retinal exam, you're gonna see an exudative retinal detachment, which is the most common sign. You can also see retinal hemorrhage, multifocal retinal edema, retinal vessel tortuosity, retinal perivascular edema, papal edema, vitriol hemorrhage, hyphema, secondary glaucoma, and retinal degeneration. You, the most common presenting complaint for these guys is that they were all of a sudden seeming blind. Um, the treatment can often lead to retinal reattachment, um, and there's restoration of vision only in a minority of patients and may not re resolve the ocular um, abnormalities. And retinal detachment has been reported in cases with a systolic blood pressure as low as 168. So next is the brain. Hypertensive encephalopathy is what it's called. Um, there have been reported to be neurologic signs in 29% and 46% of hypertensive cats. It's a common issue seen post renal transplant in people. Um, in early phases, it's usually responsive to antihypertensive treatment and you can see improvement in them. It's more likely in cats with a sudden increase in blood pressure with a systolic greater than 180. Um, clinical signs are those that you would see for intracranial disease, which can sometimes be very nonspecific. So we can see lethargy, seizures, acute onset of altered mentation, altered behavior, disorientation, balance disturbances, and focal neurologic deficits um, from stroke-associated ischemia. CNS and abnormalities usually indicate hemorrhage and infarction. On MRI, you're gonna see a vasogenic edema in usually the occipital parietal lobes of the brain. In old cats with hypertension, they have a high risk factor for ischemic myelopathy of the cranial cervical spinal cord. And these cats are usually tetraparetic or tetraplegic with intact nociception. So the last organ is gonna be the heart. Increased cardiac output is rarely the cause of hypertension in dogs and cats. Um, on exam in these guys, you might hear a heart murmur and or a gallop. So cats are very common for this. Um, they usually on echo are gonna have a cardiomegaly associated with a left ventricular concentric hypertrophy. Um, which can be hard in some cases to differentiate from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but usually what you do is if they're hypertensive and you see that, you treat for the hypertension and monitor and see if um, their cardiac signs improve. Cats with undiagnosed hypertension are very common that you'll hear a cat with heart murmur, maybe you don't know they have hypertension, you put them on fluids and they go into heart failure. Um, they can be very sensitive to that with a little bit of fluids. Hypertension has also been associated with epistaxis, but is rarely the primary cause. And aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection, which are seen in people, are pretty rare complications in dogs and cats with hypertension. 
So when should you be looking for hypertension? Um, whenever they have clinical abnormalities consistent with hypertensive tar target organ damage, such as ocular changes, hyphema, intracranial neurologic signs, um, renal values are elevated, um, or they have cardiovascular abnormalities. Um, measuring blood pressure in a patient with the presence of diseases and conditions casually associated with secondary hypertension, treatment of the drugs with known effect on blood pressure, or known or suspected exposure to intoxicants um, might be other cases that you would be looking for it. Let's see. In cats, the most common sign you might actually see when they are hypertensive is just they're not acting like themselves. So, you know, the ADR cat that you do blood work on is otherwise normal, but it's maybe it's uh, pupils look like this cat in this picture. It's inactive, it's lethargic. Sometimes they have a photophobia um, and aren't eating great. So this, these values are based off of the ACVIM consensus statement. So normotensive being less than 140, um, pre-hypertensive with, you know, being categorized as a low target organ damage risk being 140 to 159, and hypertensive being uh, greater than 160, but severely hypertensive being greater than 180. So diagnosis, if obviously if you see signs of target organ damage, then I think it's reasonable to treat after a single measurement. Um, you want to confirm results by measurements repeated on multiple occasions if there aren't signs of target organ damage. Um, and then if you put them into the pre-hypertension or hypertension categories with moderate risk of target organ damage, recheck it in four to eight weeks. So, if they're pre-hypertensive, when you get the first blood pressure, recheck it in four to eight weeks. If it's severe, recheck it in one to two weeks. Um, keep in mind that sight hounds have been reported to have a higher blood pressure in hospital versus other breeds, and they think this is a situational hypertension. So if you confirm that they're pre-hypertensive, then you would just continue to monitor. Um, if it's a renal patient and they're not hypertensive, then you should be monitoring their blood pressure every six months. And then obviously, as I said earlier, treat anytime there are signs of target organ damage and you're getting a hypertensive number. So this is just a flow chart for deciding um, when to treat from the consensus statement. So if there's suspect blood pressure related to target organ damage or compatible, compatible underlying condition, you check a blood pressure. If it's less than 160, recheck that blood pressure in three to six months. If it's greater than 160 and there's no signs of target organ damage, then depending on where it falls, whether that 160 to 179 or greater than 180, you're either going to recheck it in eight weeks or within two weeks. Um, if it's greater than 160 and there's signs of target organ damage, then you're going to start treatment right away. If they fell into that category of no signs and their blood pressure was 160 to 179 and you recheck it within eight weeks and it's still less than 160, then you're going to want to recheck that in three to six months. If it's greater than 160 when you recheck it, then you're going to treat um, if they fell into that. Uh, severely hypertensive category at greater than 180 and had no signs of target organ damage and you recheck it within 14 days and it's less than 160. Again, you can check in three to six months. It's greater than 160. Treat and look for an underlying condition. Um, so you're going to want to start as far as treating, you're going to want to start your antihypertensive treatment at the same time as treatment of the underlying disease. Um, what you're looking for is a gradual persistent de decrease in blood pressure. So if you start treating and you recheck in a couple of weeks and you go from a blood pressure of 200 to 180, that's okay. You don't want to bottom them out right when you start treating. Keep treating and keep monitoring and see if it continues to improve. If it doesn't, adjust your treatment. 
Um, you're more likely, if you're only partially effective, then you can increase the dose or add in a second drug. I like to maximize the first drug I start before adding in a second drug. Um, usually you're gonna end up needing second drugs in dogs, not as common in cats, but it can kind of depend on your patient population. Regardless of the initial magnitude of the blood pressure, the goal of treatment is to maximally decrease um, the risk of target organ damage. So get that blood pressure below 140 if you can. Antihypertensive therapy should be adjusted on reevaluation if systolic blood pressure is greater than or equal to 160 um, with a minimal goal of treatment to achieve a decrease in systolic to less than or equal to 160. You wanna adjust treatment if the blood pressure is less than 120 and you're also seeing signs of weakness, syncope or tachycardia. And there's no indication that salt restriction is necessary in any of these patients. And so this is just another little flow chart to help. Um, you've started your treatment, you've instituted your first line of therapy. I like to get them in about seven to 10 days, sometimes two weeks and then just what to do with each blood pressure, kind of like what we talked about. So in dogs, the consensus statement says that a ACE inhibitor is your first line. Um, they are talking, and I'll get a little bit more into this a little later, I think, but they're more talking about, so that's your RAS inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. Um, they're more talking about renal patients with proteinuria. And they're saying that because your ACE inhibitor, unlike, so your benazapril and allopril, unlike amlodipine, isn't going to increase intraglomerular pressure in the kidney. Um, but I will challenge that if you have a patient with a systolic blood pressure of greater than 200 and it's a dog, ACE inhibitors really only are gonna decrease that systolic by about 10 millimeters of mercury. And you're not gonna get to a point that you're going to be significantly enough decreasing that blood pressure. So I'd say if they don't have kidney disease or obvious kidney disease um, and they have a significantly elevated blood pressure, I'd probably actually start with a calcium channel blocker if they have significant proteinuria and hypertension, that's when I usually will start with the ACE inhibitors with the caveat of patients with significant azotemia. I'm going to be a little less likely to max out on an ACE inhibitor and will probably start with a calcium channel blocker if the hypertension is significant. Um, in cats, the consensus statement says that the primary drug should be a calcium channel blocker as your first line. Um, they work really well and really quickly in cats with a mean decrease of 28 to 55 millimeters of mercury. Um, starting dose of amlodipine is a quarter of the 2.5 milligram tablet, so 0.625 milligrams per cat per day. Um, they do say if blood pressure is greater than 200, you can start at 1.25 milligrams per cat per day. Um, they don't recommend using transdermal. It's too big of a molecule and there's no evidence that it is absorbed appropriately. Some adverse effects that you can see with it include peripheral edema as well as gingival hyperplasia. Um, the gingival hyperplasia is pretty uncommon in dogs, but very, very common in cats. Excuse me, other way around. Gingival hyperplasia is very uncommon in cats, but very, very common in dogs, especially with long-term use. Um, the newer drug that's out on the market for cats is Telmisartan. It comes in a liquid 10 milligrams um, per mil. It's called Seminentra. Um, they say it's okay as the second line and they recommend starting at about two mgs per kg per day. Um, if you have a cat with cardiac disease, or is uh, hyperthyroid, it is very tachycardic and hypertensive, you can add in a beta blocker um, if they are having hyperaldosteronism. Uh, aldosterone inhibitor is the better treatment. And then I have some, it's rare, but I have some drugs that you can use if you're concerned for a PO in a cat.
So um, I have some doses for medications in, hip, in here, ACE inhibitors. Again, I really don't use them specifically for blood pressure. I'm going to add them into my patients that are hypertensive and proteinuric, particularly in dogs. Um, Benazapril, I tend to prefer. I start it at once a day and work my way up. Um, Enalapril, you can also use. You have to start it at every 12 hours just because of the way the medication is absorbed. Um, the newer medication, your angiotensin receptor blocker, if you, that's usually for me going to be one of my secondary blood pressure medications that I use in Telmosartan. It comes in, I believe, 10 and 20 milligram tablets and the human side, and it's going to be one to two mg per kg every 24 hours. You do have to be careful in your azotemic patients, though, because it is st still working similarly to an ACE inhibitor and potentially decreasing renal blood flow. Um, so you can get worsening of azotemia. And so if it's already a severely azotemic patient and they're otherwise struggling with eating and things like that, I'm very cautious with using those medications in them. Emlodipine really is my first line, dogs and cats, most of the time for hypertension. I know in dogs, I'm gonna get the most significant improvement in hypertension. It's going to work quickly, and the same is for cats. Um, sometimes I'll add in prazosin when I've really kind of maxed out my amlodipine. I've added in telmosartan, and nothing else seems to be working. Uh, you can also do the same thing with phenoxybenzene. I really haven't done that, except in cases of like pheochromocytomas. If you're worried for hyperaldosteronism, particularly in cats, that's the dose of spironolactone that I usually use in those guys at one to two mg per kg, once to twice a day. I usually start at the low end at once a day and work my way up over time. Um, and then there, if you have tachycardic patients, propanolol or atenolol, um, there are some doses as well that you can utilize. So in emergency situations, what are some of your options? Um, hypertensive emergencies are going to be situations where you have a marked increase in blood pressure with significant signs of ongoing target organ damage. Um, you, these patients usually have a systolic blood pressure of greater than or equal to 180 putting them in that high risk target organ damage category with signs of um, various target organ damage. But if they're intracranial signs, then you know you really have to get on them really quick and they usually need immediate ER treatment. Um, if the hypertension is chronic, there's usually autoregulatory vascular beds within the brain and kidney that may have adapted to that higher perfusion pressure. Um, and so you really want to be slow with these guys and decreasing their blood pressure because a sudden decrease in their blood pressure could result in hypoperfusion and make them much worse neurologically. Um, so initially your systolic blood pressure should be decreased by 10% over the first hour and about 15% over the next few hours, followed by a gradual return to normal blood pressure. Um, so if you look at the consensus statement, these are a lot of the drugs that they're going to recommend. Phenoldepam, we don't even carry, I don't think we carry any of these drugs here. Um, but if you have them handy, these are some doses you can use. But I'm going to tell you right now that amlodipine is your best friend. If that's all you have, that's okay. Hydralazine you can also use, and you can script it out to a human pharmacy and have the owner bring it back and also start it. Um, but amlodipine is, if you learn anything from this lecture, it's the best drug for chronic and emergent hypertension. It works quickly. It's not going to bottom them out very quickly. Um, and you can increase the dose, you know, give them another dose if they need it in that first 24 hours to try to get your blood pressure down to um, a safer level. Oh. And that is the end because I didn't go as in depth in the emergency situations, but I will take any questions now.
One asks if you could write, provide copies um, of the drug doses in flow charts. In flow charts? The, um, I think the graphs. Oh, and the flow charts? Yeah. I can definitely do that. And all this information is also in the ACVIM consensus statement on hypertension. So another question for proteinuria without hypertension, um, what is your choice for a dog? I'm usually gonna start with benazepril. And I usually do somewhere between a quarter to a half a mg per kg and I start it once a day and titrate up if they're not improving. I usually, so the way I do it is I start the benazepril um, and then a week, I have a baseline kidney values already because it's an ACE inhibitor. So in theory, it could affect their kidney values and electrolytes. Um, and then about a week or two after starting that, I'm gonna get a recheck kidney to value and electrolytes to make sure that I haven't impacted those significantly. And then about a month after starting it, I'm gonna recheck another urinalysis and UPC to evaluate my treatment. And if I've had a decrease anywhere from you know, 30 to 40% in proteinuria, um, I'm usually gonna make a decision to either recheck another one in a month or adjust my medication. Um, another question, any tips for avoiding situational hypertension or determining if a pet's issue is situational or real? Yeah, um, avoiding it is tough. And for each patient, it can be different. Like some, you gotta get that blood pressure right when they walk into your building um, before you do absolutely anything else. Uh, other patients, you're gonna want to do it after they've sat in there for maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I know with COVID, a lot of us are not letting owners in the building, but if possible, you know, having that owner help to restrain the patient and talk to them. Um, the biggest thing you're going to notice when it's a situational issue is they're going to be tachycardic um, and just noticeably look stressed. But if their heart rate is really high and their blood pressure is high, they're more likely than not a stressed patient. And obviously, if anyone has specific cases that they wanted to ask about, you're welcome to email us to um, at our medicine at indievet.com. Email is probably easiest. All right, that seemed to be the last question. Um, like I said, thanks for everybody for attending. Um, you will get your CE certificates um, either um, later this week or next week. Um, but if you guys have any questions, please email medicine at IndieVet and they can answer those for you. Um, and we do have one other one. Um, okay. Can you use something like gabapentin for cats for BP? So I don't use gabapentin for blood pressure specifically in cats, but if I have a really angry cat um, that I really need to get a blood pressure on because it's azotemic or I have other concerns about it being hypertensive, um, I'm gonna use gabapentin to try to help prevent that situational hypertension so that I can get true measurements. But gabapentin in itself is not gonna treat a true hypertension um, it's only going to treat situational. All right. Thanks, Dr. Bryce.